Chapter 6 Sorry I'm late, Jenny said, tossing down her backpack and pulling off her jacket. The bus had a flat tire. Do you believe it? We were stranded. They had to call out another bus. The driver wouldn't change a tire. It's against union rules. She realized she was chattering a mile a minute, but she felt terrible being late two nights in a row. You should leave a little earlier, Mr. Hagen said, pulling nervously on his tie. It's okay, Mrs. Hagen said, giving her husband a quick frown. You know we have plenty of time. She handed Jenny's jacket to him. He started for the coat closet, remembered the door was jammed, then jogged up the stairs to put it in the bedroom closet. Don't pay any attention to him, Mrs. Hagen whispered confidentially, bringing her face close to Jenny's ear. Jenny could smell her perfume. It smelled just like her mother's. He's been very nervous. That's why I decided to get him out a couple of nights a week. I see, Jenny said, feeling foolish. She couldn't think of anything else to say. What was she supposed to say? I think it's the new job and a new house and everything, Mrs. Hagen continued in a low voice, looking up to the top of the stairs to make sure Mr. Hagen wasn't returning. He's really a very sweet man, but lately he just seems to get excited about things. He worries so much more than he used to. Jenny started to say, I see again, but decided just to nod her head. I try to keep things smooth for him, Mrs. Hagen whispered. If little things go wrong in the house while you're here, I'd really appreciate your not troubling him about them. You know what I mean. Sure, Jenny said. She felt flattered that Mrs. Hagen talked to her as an adult, confided in her that way. Mr. Hagen reappeared on the stairs, and his wife quickly put a forced smile on her face. Try to get Donnie down a little early tonight, he said, picking up his gray wool overcoat from where it was draped over the banister. He's been looking a little pale today. He may be coming down with something. He looks perfectly fine to me, Mrs. Hagen said lightly. He is naturally pale, you know, Mike. Not that pale, Mr. Hagen insisted. The number where we'll be is on the pad in the kitchen. She knows, she knows, his wife said, pulling him by the hand. See you later, Jenny. It shouldn't be too late. We're going to a very boring party. Be sure to keep the doors locked and the curtains pulled, Mr. Hagen warned as they stepped out the front door. Jenny locked the door behind them and went to look for Donnie. She found him in the den, playing with a pile of small action figures, space warriors of some kind. He dropped the figures in his hands when he saw her come in. Let's play hide-and-seek, he said. Don't you say hi, she asked, pretending to be hurt. Hi, he said. Let's play hide-and-seek. I really don't want to, she said, stretching. I'm kind of tired tonight. Why don't we just settle down together in the big chair and watch a tape or something? I don't want to, Donnie said stubbornly, sticking out his lower lip to show he planned to stick to his guns. Let's see if you can go an entire night without saying, I don't want to, she said, sitting down at the edge of the chair cushion. I don't want to, he said. I asked for that, she thought. I want to play hide-and-seek, he insisted, grabbing her hand and trying to pull her up off the chair. Stop pulling me. I said I don't want to. I want to watch TV. She realized she was sounding as petulant as he was. Well, why don't we compromise, he suggested. Suddenly, he was the grown-up. Compromise? That's a good word. She laughed. He looked so serious. I learned it in school, of course, he said, talking to her as if she were six. Okay, what's your compromise? We play hide-and-seek for just a little while. They both laughed. He knew he was being funny, and he knew it was impossible to say no to him. He was just too clever, too charming, too cute. She ruffled his hair. It felt soft as feathers. Okay, a little while, she said. Go hide. I'll be it. But don't make it too hard, okay? He was already out of the room. Count to a hundred, he yelled from somewhere down the back hall. Jenny counted silently to herself for a short while and then stopped. This house with its endless rooms cluttered with antique furniture, dark, empty hallways, deep closets, and dozens of hidden nooks and crannies was a great place to play hide-and-seek, especially if you were the one who was hiding. Why did she feel so nervous? Because she'd much rather keep Donnie in sight, much rather know where he was. She was the adult here, she realized. She couldn't get into the game the way she would if she were a kid. She had to be responsible. Did that explain her feeling of dread, or was it something else? She had to learn to say no to Donnie, she decided. Here she was, playing this game she didn't want to play at all, just because she couldn't ever say no to him. Here I come, ready or not, she shouted. She walked quickly through the living room first, keeping her eyes low, looking under chairs and tables, even though she knew he was most likely in another room. Here I come, she repeated loudly, hoping he would reply somehow and give himself away. Hearing the sound of a car out on the street, she stopped. She stood by the mantel, listening, 
waiting to see if the car stopped or passed by. It passed by. Okay, I'm going to find you now, she shouted. She stepped into the back hallway. What was that? A giggle coming from a room she had never explored? She entered the dark room, and her hand fumbled against the wall until she found the light switch. When she pushed it, an old Tiffany-style lamp in a corner cast dim orange light over the room. Where was she? It appeared to be an extra sitting room. It was hard to tell exactly, because of all the furniture. What appeared to be tall armchairs and two high-backed facing sofas was covered with bedsheets. A thick layer of dust had settled over everything in the room. A massive tangle of cobwebs covered the one working lamp, so thick they blocked much of the light and cast eerie shadows on the maroon wallpaper. It looked just like a room in a haunted house movie. Jenny pictured the sheets rising up off the chairs and floating after her. Donnie, are you hiding in here? she called, her voice a little shaky. A sheet over one of the tall armchairs looked a little lumpy. Had he crawled under the filthy cover to hide inside the chair? She crept closer to the chair. Everything smelled musty and mildewed. The dust was so thick she felt she couldn't breathe. Are you here? she cried. No reply. She crept closer. She reached for the bottom of the sheet. She pulled it up quickly, sending a flurry of dust into the air. No, Donnie. She coughed, choking on the dry dust. I'm getting out of here, she said aloud, and turned and walked quickly from the silent room, flicking the light switch and returning it to the darkness as she left. Still coughing, she headed into the pantry. The shelves at floor level, she remembered, were empty, perfect hiding places. What was that creaking sound in the kitchen? Was that Donnie? She stopped and listened. No. Maybe it wasn't coming from the kitchen. Maybe she heard the creaking of her own shoes over the soft hallway floorboards. She heard it again. Not footsteps, but a creaking sound. She passed by the pantry, peeked quickly into the laundry room. Gotcha, she yelled, running to look behind the washer dryer. But he wasn't there. She turned and walked to the kitchen. Okay, Donnie, here I come. I know you're in here, she called from the doorway. Silence. Then the creaking sound again, this time behind her. Was it just the house groaning and creaking? The old house had dozens of different sounds that it made, all of them frightening, all of them mysterious and unexplainable. She stopped to listen. Was someone walking in the front hallway? On an impulse, she turned from the kitchen and ran at full speed to the front hallway. No, no one there. Back to the kitchen, feeling chilled, her stomach rumbling, wishing she hadn't agreed to this game, wishing she could end it now. She pulled open a low cabinet door. Gotcha! But he wasn't inside. Donnie, can we quit now? I give. Silence. Can you hear me? I really don't want to play anymore. Silence. The creaking sounded again, followed by the click of some appliance turning on. Donnie? She ducked down to search under the kitchen table. Not there. She pulled open the cleaning supply closet. Not there. I give. You're too good a hider. I give. Silence. More silence. What if something had happened to him? What if he had picked a dangerous place to hide and had gotten himself trapped somewhere? What if he had fallen and hit his head and was lying unconscious in the basement and... Stop! Donnie, I give. You can come out now. Maybe he wasn't in the kitchen after all. Maybe he just couldn't hear her. She was about to leave the kitchen when the door to the narrow ironing board closet flew open. Ah! She screamed in fright and tumbled to the floor as a figure came flying out at her from the tiny closet, just ahead of the ironing board, which swung down to the floor with a deafening clang. Donnie, she cried, you scared me to death. He jumped on top of her. He was laughing and crying out triumphantly at the same time. He thought it was hilarious. Get off, get off me, you really scared me. But her protests made him laugh even harder. Finally, he stopped laughing and helped pull her to her feet. Your turn to hide, he said. Oh no, she cried. The game is over. Scaredy cat, chicken, don't call names, Donnie. It's your bedtime. It took another 45 minutes to get him tucked into bed. He was so excited from his hide-and-seek triumph, he couldn't calm down. She had to read three books to him, play with his stuffed animals for a while, give him a bowl of cornflakes, and bring him three glasses of apple juice, before he finally caved in and agreed to try to sleep. Feeling totally wiped out, and still a little shaky from the fright he had given her, she started down the stairs. She had brought a lot of homework, but she knew she wasn't going to look at it. She was just going to veg out in front of the tube. She was halfway down the stairs when the phone rang. Where was the nearest phone? In the kitchen? No, the den. 
She ran across the living room and got to the phone on the desk in the den by the fourth ring. It was an old-fashioned black dial phone. She was surprised by how heavy the receiver was as she lifted it to her ear. Hello? She was out of breath from scrambling to the phone. Silence. Hello? She couldn't hear anything. Maybe this old phone didn't work. Then she heard it. Soft breathing on the other end. Someone was definitely on the line. Hello? Her voice sounded funny, high-pitched, tight. She struggled to catch her breath. She heard the breathing a little louder. Hagen Residence, she said. Who's calling? The breathing became louder. Was someone trying to scare her? Hello? Hello? More loud breathing. Whoever it was was sort of groaning into the phone now. What is going on here? She asked herself, feeling the fear begin to grow in the pit of her stomach. Suddenly, she had an idea. A crazy idea. A stupid idea. An idea only someone with her crazy imagination would have. Of course, she told herself, there's no way this is who I think it is on the other end of the line. But I've just got to make sure. Hello? What do you want? She repeated. The loud breathing continued. Jenny gently placed the receiver down on the green felt blotter on the desktop. Then she ran as quickly and as silently as she could, out of the den, across the living room, up the stairs. Of course, this was insane. Truly insane. No way. No way the breather could be him. Of all the silly ideas. But when she got to the top landing, turned, and burst into Donnie's room, there he was, standing by his low white desk, the telephone held tightly to his ear. Chapter 7 Donnie! Jenny screamed. He looked up, startled. His blue eyes grew wide, and he seemed to go chalk white instantly. She grabbed the phone from his hand roughly and held it up to her ear. There was nothing but a dial tone. Donnie, why? His face twisted into a frightened frown. He looked as if he were about to cry. You scared me. What were you doing on the phone? Listening? Tears formed in his eyes, big round ones. He rubbed them away with his little white hands. Listening? What do you mean? She looked at the phone. It had buttons for two separate lines. The phone had probably been left by the previous owner of the house. Donnie could have called her on this phone. Just listening, he bawled. Why did you scare me like that, Jenny? He walked over and buried his face in her side so she wouldn't see him crying. She had a sudden pang of guilt. I'm sorry, she said softly, patting his head. Don't cry. I'm sorry. Why did you call me? Were you trying to scare me? No, he said, the sound muffled because his head was pressed against her waist. No, you weren't trying to scare me? No, I didn't call. What? What do you mean? I didn't call. Somebody else called. I was asleep. The ringing woke me up. So I picked it up to listen, but no one was talking. Then you jumped in and scared me. He started to cry loudly, pressing his head against her. Jenny felt terrible. Was he telling the truth? Of course he was. How could she have suspected a six-year-old child? How could she have suspected Donnie? Once again, her stupid imagination had gotten her into trouble. She hugged him and apologized and did her best to comfort him. Then she led him back to his bed and tucked him in. Now tell me the story, he said. No, Donnie, it's way too late, and I really don't think I could tell it right now. But you promised, he whined. He was so tired he could barely keep his eyes open. You promised and you forgot. Next time, I'll tell it twice, she said, smoothing the feathery blonde hair off his forehead. I just can't tonight, Donnie. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. He was too sleepy to protest any more. She tiptoed out of the room, feeling guilty, feeling like a monster telling herself she'd never suspect him of anything ever again. It hadn't even sounded like a child's breathing. What had made her think it was Donnie in the first place? And the furious way she had leaped at him and grabbed the phone out of his hand, she'd never forgive herself. I was just scared, that's all, she argued with herself. Don't make excuses, Jenny. You wanted the caller to be a six-year-old, because then you wouldn't have to be afraid. Then you'd be in control. But he looked so guilty when I walked into his room. The way he went pale like that, as if he knew he'd just been caught doing something terrible. She didn't have any more time to argue with herself. As she reached the bottom of the stairs, she hung up the phone. It rang almost immediately. The sound sent a chill down her back. She stood frozen in the front hallway, her eyes closed, wishing it away, wishing it to stop. But it rang again and again. I'm just not going to answer it, she told herself. But then she realized the ringing would wake up Donnie again. And what if it wasn't the breather calling back? What if it was a call from Mr. or Mrs. Hagen? 
She took a deep breath, ran to the den, and picked up the phone. Hello? Silence. Hello? Hi, babes. The voice was a hoarse whisper. Who is this? Jenny demanded. Hi, babes. Are you all alone? She couldn't tell if it was a man or a boy. What do you want? She tried not to sound frightened, but she couldn't help it. Are you all alone in that big house? Well, don't worry. Company's coming. Listen, you. She heard a soft click at the other end. Chapter 8 Jenny stared at the heavy receiver in her hand and listened to the drone of the dial tone until her heart stopped pounding. Her hand was trembling. Her throat felt tight and dry. Someone was trying to scare her and was doing a pretty good job of it. Someone knew she was there. Someone knew she was alone. Someone knew her. Or did they? Everyone knew about weirdos who got their kicks by making sick phone calls to strangers. Maybe this was some creep picking phone numbers at random. Some guy going through the phone book, seeing who he could upset, who he could get a reaction from. Or maybe it was a kid, some guy from school, trying to be funny. Trying to be funny? Chuck? Would Chuck do something like that? No, of course not. He was a joker, a goof. Everything he did was good-natured. Or was it? She didn't really know Chuck that well. Actually, she didn't know Chuck at all. She suddenly remembered their conversation at the pizza oven, how Chuck's mood had suddenly changed after she told him she couldn't go out with him on Saturday night. He hadn't seemed so good-natured then. In fact, he was downright obnoxious. It was as if he had turned against her, as if he had tried to make her angry. But perhaps he was just disappointed, just hurt that she had turned him down and that she hadn't wanted him to drop by the Hagens when she was babysitting. That didn't mean he was capable of making those frightening calls. That didn't mean he would do such a disgusting, sick thing. She refused to believe it was Chuck. But then who? Someone nearby? Someone in the neighborhood? Someone who had been watching the house? Had seen her arrive? Had seen the Hagens leave? Was there someone out there who really was preparing to harm her? Are you all alone? he had whispered. Are you all alone in that big house? He knew where she was. He knew she was alone. Don't worry. Company's coming. Company's coming. When? Tonight? The neighbor. What was his name? Willers. Willers would know she was there. Willers would know she was alone. Of course. That gravelly voice. That hoarse whisper. Willers was so creepy. The way he stared at her. The way he looked her up and down. It had to be Willers. She grabbed the phone to call the police. Then she took her hand away. She had never called the police before. She had only seen it done in movies and on TV. People in real life didn't call the police, did they? They did if they were frightened. They did if someone was threatening them. Someone who lived right next door. But would they believe her? What would they say? Oh, Jenny, she imagined the policeman's board reply. We all know about your wild imagination. These calls are in your mind. Please don't bother us. We have real work to do. Even if they believed her, what would they do? They probably had dozens of weird calls reported every night. What could they do about it? Send someone out to hold her hand until the Hagens returned home? Are you all alone? Don't worry. Company's coming. I don't care, she thought. I'm calling the police. She reached for the phone again, and as she did, it seemed to explode in her hand. Ah! she screamed and jumped a mile in the air. But it wasn't exploding. It was only ringing. Again. Oh no, she said aloud. Please, leave me alone. Her hand reached out and gripped the receiver, but she didn't pick it up. She could feel each ring vibrating up her arm. Finally, she picked it up just to stop the noise. Hello? Her voice sounded strange to her, high and frightened. Hi, Jenny. Just wanted to see how you're doing. Mr. Hagen? Right. Everything okay? I guess you were far from the phone. It rang so many times I was a little worried. I, uh, was in the bathroom. Sorry. Was that the best excuse she could think of? It didn't matter. It was good enough. She was very relieved to hear his voice. Donnie okay? Did you get him to bed early? Well, pretty early. He's fine. No problem. Sometimes he takes advantage of his sitters and stays up really late. He looks like an angel, but he can be a real devil. Did he really mean that? Was Donnie really capable of being evil? Of course not. 
Have you lost your mind entirely, Jenny? Just calm down. Take a deep breath and calm yourself down. No, he was no trouble, really. Mr. Hagen certainly is a nervous parent, she thought. She looked at her watch. He'd only been away two and a half hours. Why was he calling? Is he sleeping okay? Sometimes he throws off his covers, and then he gets cold in the middle of the night. I checked him once. He was fine, she said. I'll go up and check again. Good. Sounds like everything is under control. We won't be too late. Another hour or two. You have the number here, right? Yes, I have it. Should she tell him about the calls? She was so tempted to tell him. But no. She held herself back. He's so nervous he'd probably call out the FBI, the CIA, and the National Guard, she told herself. And Mrs. Higgin asked me not to upset him. Okay, Jenny. Bye. Hope you don't mind my checking in like this. No, I'm glad. I mean, it's okay. Everything's fine. Good. Help yourself to anything in the kitchen. And keep the doors locked. Don't worry. Yes, I will. Thanks. Finally, he hung up. Despite her fear, Jenny had to smile. Mr. Hagen looked so big and macho, but he was such a nervous Nellie. He was sweet, though. It was sweet the way he worried about Donnie. She realized she felt better after talking with him. She decided she wouldn't call the police after all. They would probably only take down the information and then forget about it. What else could they do? She felt edgy, restless. She paced back and forth in the living room for a while, but the creaking floor and the ticking of the grandfather's clock made her even more nervous. She went back to the den and pulled her government textbook from her backpack. But there was no way she could concentrate on a separation of powers tonight. She shoved the book back into the backpack, paced back and forth in the small den for a few minutes, then decided to get a Coke in the kitchen. Crossing the living room again, a framed photograph on an end table by the worn sofa caught her eye. It was a color portrait of Donnie. She had never noticed it before. She walked to the end table and picked up the photo to examine it more closely. He must have been only two or three when this was taken, she thought. Then her mouth dropped open in surprise. The child in the blue photo looked a lot like Donnie, had the same blue eyes, the same white blonde hair, but it wasn't Donnie. For one thing, this child had a pink ribbon in its hair and was wearing a green corduroy jumper. This child was a girl. Jenny stared at the photo. The child was so beautiful, it was hard to take her eyes off her. Donnie has a sister, Jenny told herself. But where? Then she realized what the horrible truth must be. Donnie had a sister. She drops the photograph onto the desk and looked away. She couldn't bear to look at it any longer. This explained a lot. It certainly explained why Mr. Hagen was so nervous and worried about Donnie. The poor man. The poor family. It probably also explained why Mr. Hagen had changed jobs. Why they had moved to this neighborhood on the far edge of town. The room suddenly seemed stuffy and hot. Jenny went to the window and pulled back the heavy, crushed velvet drapes. She peered out through the frost-stained glass. It was cool by the window. The cold wind seeped in through the cracked glass. Outside, the wind swirled, whistling loudly, shaking the leafless trees, making them clatter like dry, brittle skeletons. The moon was full, a gold coin in a pink-gray sky. On the radio, they had said it could snow. The pink sky meant that snow clouds hovered above. The strange lighting gave the ground an unreal look, made everything clearer and brighter than real life. What was that in the front yard? Jenny squinted through the glass. Were they squirrels? The squirrels seemed to be holding paws. There were four or five of them, dancing in a circle, holding on to each other, twirling faster and faster, first in one direction, then the other. No, that's not right. Jenny realized they weren't squirrels. They were leaves, blowing round and round in the swirling winds. Stop doing that, girl, she scolded herself. They'll lock you up if you keep seeing things. She squinted again, trying to make the leaves turn back into squirrels. It was such a wonderful, comical scene. But the wind had changed. The leaves had blown away. She couldn't bring it back. She had a sudden chill. The face of the little girl in the picture, Donnie's sister, floated back into her mind. She tried to blink it away. Taking a step back, she started to pull the drapes into place but something else outside caught her eye. Was there a car parked at the curb in front of the house? No, it was probably a tree stump. She started to scold herself again for seeing what wasn't there, but no matter how hard she squinted, she couldn't make the small, black car turn into a tree stump. It was a car. She wasn't imagining it. And that shadow in the front seat, the shadow moved. There was a man sitting in a car. 
Why? What was he doing there? Was he watching her? Was he waiting for... For what? Don't worry. Company's coming. Company's coming. Jenny yanked the drapes shut and went one more time to make sure the doors were locked.